uh, my lords, I've taken the speeches of Lord Hope and Lord Scott. Lord Walker dissented. I may have to come back to the dissent, but um, <coughs> I'll stretch my speeches as a majority. Lord Carswell's speech um, starts at page 68 in the bottom. <coughs> We see at paragraph 75 <coughs> on page 69, 24 to the report. Mm -hmm. In respect of the Commissioner's appeal in the case of Condé Nast, Lord Carswell agreed with Lord Hope and Lord Newberger that the appeal should be dismissed. He says, It seems to me that the two issues arise out of this case. The first, which relates to the individual taxpayer and others in like situations, is whether the Commissioners can be permitted in the circumstances of the case to refuse Condé Nast's claim for repayment of input tax, which has not already been deducted. The second and more general import is whether the commissioners or the legislature have taken sufficient steps to specify a transitional period for submitting claims for the deduction of input tax despite the introduction of the time limit as of our regulation 21A. Then in paragraph 76, he discusses what various possible time limits might have been. And he says in the last sentence of paragraph 76, if the case were to be decided on this issue, I should have been prepared to hold that a reasonable transitional period extended later than the 27th of June 2003. However, at paragraph 77, he continues, for the reasons given by Lord Hope and Lord Newberger, I do not consider that this is the determinative issue. I agree with them that it's for Parliament or for the commissioners who must disseminate the information sufficiently to all uh, VAT taxpayers to introduce prospectively an adequate transitional period which will apply to all claims for the deduction of input tax that had accrued before the introduction of the time limit. And I'm sorry to bang home the point, not just those that have disappeared in the puff of smoke. That was not done for the 27th of June 2003, <coughs> and indeed has not yet been effective. When such a step is taken, the time limit applied by Reg 291A must be disapplied. Like Lord Hope, I would apply that reasoning to Mr. Fleming's appeal as well as to that of Condé Nast. <coughs> and then Lord Newberger. Um, my lords have already been shown all of paragraph 79. Um, I'm not going to go back to the principles that he identified. But picking it up, please, at paragraph 80. On the basis of the arguments addressed to your lordship's house, I believe the only controversial aspect centres on propositions H and J. The issue is whether it is open <coughs> to the court to disapply the retrospective limitation for a limited period as opposed to permanently, in cases where the legislation imposing a restrictive time limit contains no transitional period, as in the present case and as in the Marks and Spencer. And his answer, Lord Newberger's answer, in common with the others of the majority, was no. He then discusses um, Marks and Spencer and Grundig, in particular Grundig at paragraph 41. He then says at paragraph 82 that he can't see a difference in principle between the case where there's an inadequate <coughs> transitional period and where there's no transitional period. And then at paragraph 83, he says, um, in light of these considerations, it follows from the retrospective effect of Reg 291A and the absence of any transitional provision that the duty of the United Kingdom courts is to disapply the regulations in relation to claims based on accrued rights made during an appropriate period. Although the commissioners did not accept <coughs> the proposition, that proposition for most of the litigation, they now accept that, it, that Regulation 291A ought to have included a transitional provision in respect of claims based on accrued rights, and that the regulation ought to be disapplied to them by the courts. Accordingly, the issue to be determined is the proper characterization and duration of the period of disapplication. Uh, before we move on, Mr. Grzynski, That is a concession being made by the revenue. It is. Before the House of Lords. It is. 
So what did they mean, a revenue mean, by accrued rights? They can't have been conceding as much as you're submitting, because that would have ended the case. Condé Nast would have won. But they were resisting that. They, they were only, surely, acknowledging that what they meant by accrued rights were the puffing, puff, uh, puff of smoke cases. Well, whether that's what the revenue meant or not, it's clear that the House of Lords, by accrued rights, included all those where the payments <coughs> had been made prior to the coming into force of the new legislation. Otherwise, their judgment would have been wrong, and I'm going to come on to this, for the tail end of the Condé Nast claim. Except that what Mr. Baldry submits is that the revenue never made that argument. Well, I'll come on to deal with that, if I may. Yes. And I've already shown my Lord's <laughs> speeches earlier where um, I think it was Lord Scott had very firmly in mind that particular segment of payments mm. and referred to <coughs> expressly. And then at paragraph 84, it's the Commissioner's primary case that the appropriate period of disapplication should be equivalent to the transitional period which the legislature ought to have accorded under community law, but failed to do so. That seems to me a surprising proposition. <clears throat> I'm not going to read all of it. Then if we go, please, to paragraph 88, this point seems to me a second reason for rejecting the Commissioner's primary case. As I have mentioned, the valid limitation period must be fixed in advance, see MNS para 39. The same principle must, as a matter of logic, apply to a transitional period which has to be included when a new retrospective time limit is introduced. After all, the transitional period serves the same function as the limitation <coughs> period. If that is right, then I, as I see it, the period of disapplication envisaged in the last sentence of Grundig 2 in paragraph 41 must also comply with that principle. Again, it serves precisely the same purpose as a limitation period, namely to enable people with a certain type of claim, in this case a claim based on accrued right, to know within what period they have to bring their claim. And that applies just as much to the tail end of the Condé Nast claim, claim, because they want to know how long they've got. Is it six months? Is it two years? Is it something in between? As to those whose claims have disappeared in a puff of smoke. Otherwise, when no transitional period has been provided for, persons with accrued claims will not know or be able to find out with any confidence by when they have to make their claim. That is correct of the Condé Nast claim. You, you may be right, but I'm afraid, speaking for myself, and with all due respect, I don't understand that. Because if somebody wants to know, and they go to a solicitor to advise them, uh, when do I have to make my claim? It's perfectly possible to tell them. The answer is, by the end of the six-year limitation period, which Parliament has now introduced. But I've now got, let, let, let's say I made my claim, let, um, I'm Condé Nast. And I may I, I incurred an expense payment in '96. Um, as of the new limitation period, I may have only three or four days to make my claim. Yeah, yeah, th th then one gets into the question of whether that's enough of a reasonable period. I'm only dealing with: Do you know? Is it possible for somebody to advise you how long have you got? Answer: Yes. Well, the answer is you've got three days. Oh well, that can't be enough. That's a different point, Mr. Grzynski. I'm only dealing with whether there has to be knowledge. Do I know, can I tell, what is the end of the limitation period? And surely the answer to that question is yes. It may be three days, it may be three months, it may be five years and 11 months. Indeed, but Mr. Baldry says two things. First, you know that you've got three days, but we, we the revenue, don't submit that that three days is enough. But you, know, but you ought to know that even though Parliament hasn't enacted any transitional period at all, you ought to be able to predict the way the law is going to go. You ought to be able to say, well, actually, um, I know I've got another X months, which is one of the, one of the submissions made by Mr. Vider that was rejected by the majority, <coughs> but accepted to some degree by Lord Walker, who, who said that time began to run from when Grundig and m and I think it was m and had been decided. Can, can I go off to a slight tangent? Um, here, what was changed was the uh, Section 32 aspect. In our, case. Uh, in our case, yes. Um, uh, but it was six years or Section 32. Yes. Now suppose instead what Parliament had done was to say, well, we're not happy about six years. We'll reduce it to five retrospectively. Um, now, plainly, there would be some people who 
would find their rights disappearing in the puff of smoke. Yes. And they're quite plainly uh, <coughs> uh, disapplication would apply. Yes. Um, but most people would still have plenty of time. They, they, they would have one year less, but they'd have plenty of time. So in your case, they get forever until Parliament does something else. That's what I say is the effective limit. Yes. Because, um, because of the need for legal certainty, and because um, there are some whose rights may not have disappeared in a puff of smoke, but who could only have one day, or two days, or five days, or ten days to get their claims in before the expiry of the new six-year limitation, or five-year limitation period. Yes. Um, uh, it, it is not for the courts to say, well, we'll, we'll, we'll say it's all all right. And, and I quite follow That is the logic. If you reduce yeah. the period at all, <coughs> um, then anybody potentially affected has no time limit until Parliament does something else. Indeed. Yep. Can I read uh, Sorry, just, just staying with this one for a moment. I mean, it's a feeling one often has that, you know, and from a common sense point of view, there's no problem for an awful lot of people. Why should one be caught by this rather extreme looking doctrine? I mean, would one answer to that be to say there is an element of, well, there's an element of certainty involved. The public must be able to find out what the law is in a situation where rights are being curtailed, even if the answer may be it's not, so far as they are concerned. And that sort of public interest is of sufficient importance to justify the doctrine which we find in the European cases and taken up by the House of Lords in Fleming. My Lord, I would respectfully agree with all of that. That's exactly what they were saying. Yeah. Even though the corollary of that is you will get a lot of very undeserving claimants from a sort of common sense <coughs> perspective who can begin, who will get a instead of having a limitation period as Parliament plainly intended, they will in fact have complete freedom to begin their action whenever they choose, unless and until Parliament gets around to... Well, they still the have to comply with Section 32 c in Article. Well, they have to comply with that, right. yes. That is so. And, 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 Which and is what the position was beforehand, of course. Indeed. Yeah. Um, and and uh, there are all sorts of cases where you could identify um, unfairnesses at either end of the spectrum. Yeah. Either those who have only one day less than they thought, or those who have only one day to bring their claim. Mm. And the point that the yes. majority make clearly in my submission is that um, where the balance should be struck in that spectrum is a matter for Parliament, yeah. not a matter for the courts. And perhaps it's another way of making the same point to say that there's a terrible temptation to be over-influenced in all these cases by, at one extreme, the very hard cases for people who are just left with a day or two. And at the other extreme, people who seem to have got away with really a very lax state of affairs, which nobody can have ever <laughs> intended them to enjoy, when they end up having effectively no effective limitation period or a continuation of a Section 32 c regime which Parliament has unambiguously said it wants to get rid of. But, but then it was for Parliament to say then it was how Parliament, to cure that. There's a kind of element of legislative discipline here. Parliament has to do the job properly. Well, that's what the that's what their lordships were saying. Yeah. As, I, as I'll come on to okay. Mr. Brzezinski, I'm sorry to, to labour this, but this is obviously at the heart of this ground of appeal. Yes. C can I just go back to my lord or just as Huey's scenario? That, can I start with this scenario? Suppose you'd never had se like something like Section 32. Yep. Right. You just have a six-year time limit. You couldn't complain about that under EU law. And, and the fact that you didn't know or might never reasonably have had grounds to find out that you had a cause of action until 10 years later, that's neither here nor there, isn't it? On the current state of the law, that is correct. Yeah, all right. So Parliament has, as my Lord put to you, Parliament has to date had a six-year limitation period and decides in its wisdom that it's going to reduce it to five years. So leave aside the puff of smoke cases, right? There are some people, as my Lord says, who still have plenty of time, although now they've got one year less. And what, what, what's your submission? That in that situation, Parliament must expressly enact a transitional provision. Yes. And what if they say in their transitional provision, it's five years? 
Sorry, how does the five years work? Well, wait, 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 why isn't the new limitation period an adequate transitional Because it's not a transitional period at all, because it doesn't cater for the people who are at the tail end of the five years have mm. got one day, two days, <coughs> three days, or five days. Oh, I see. So that's no transitional period. That's just a limitation period. And, 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 and Grundig and m and and the, and the House of Lords have made it abundantly clear yeah. that you need to have a transitional mm. period. And so because of the presence of those people, at least potentially, it means that Parliament doesn't have the power to enact five years for everyone else. Without a transitional period. We're reducing it from six years to five years. The others don't need a transitional period. No, I agree. So, you, you, so Parliament has acted unlawfully in EU law terms because it has failed to give an opportunity to people who don't need it. Well, no, my Lord. Parliament has failed to act in accordance with um, the principle of certainty because it's failed to address the category of people who do need it and then explain who in Parliament's view how long that period should last for and that's what the House of Lords has found. Yes, I see. And that point is emphasised, if I may say so, in Lord Newberger's uh, speech at paragraph 88 in the last sentence. Where no tra otherwise, he says, where no transitional period has been provided for, persons with accrued claims, including those who have one day, two days, a couple of weeks to go, will not know or be able to find out with any confidence by when they have to make their claim. They won't know whether they ought to infer they've got another three weeks to make it, five weeks to make it, two months to make it. In other words, the community law requirement of legal certainty cannot be met by the Commissioner's primary contention. I, mean, I, I absolutely follow why you're relying on this. I mean, I suppose there might, in a way, be said to be a similar problem if Parliament had enacted a six-month transitional period. Because well, that would give people enough time to plan. That's well, the but there'd be a question as to whether that was all, uh, that did give them enough. But that's a matter for Parliament, my uh, Well, it's not just a matter for Parliament. There would be a question for the court yes. as to whether that mm. was an adequate period. That's the Grundig situation where, mm. where, where, where the Italian... Yeah, system. 90 days. Yeah. Um, so if Parliament had said six months, still taxpayers wouldn't necessarily know where they were because they'd think to themselves, well, is six months good enough or not? But, well, I would respectfully disagree. They'd have, th th then Parliament would have met the requirement of legal certainty by telling them by when they have to bring their claim. Well, suppose they'd gone for 90 days. Parliament would have met the requirement of certainty by saying they had to bring their claim within 90 days. But that wouldn't survive an EU challenge. Well, it might or might not. But you would say there are different requirements here. Legal certainty is one, but there's also effectiveness. effectiveness. And the effectiveness point is the one that pushes you beyond the 30 days or the 90 days. But it's the, it's the certainty point that means <coughs> you have it in the first place. And, and, and then there's this important passage at the beginning of paragraph 90. I cannot accept the adequate transitional period referred to in that sentence, that <coughs> Court of Justice's judgment in Grundig, was intended to be one referred to on an ad hoc basis. That's exactly what is being suggested by the Commission, to be applied retrospectively from the date the new limitation period came into force, let alone to start and even end in circumstances where the great majority of those who are intended to benefit from it would reasonably be unaware of its existence. Such an interpretation would be quite inconsistent with the thrust of the reasoning of the Court of Justice. In my opinion, in the last sentence of Para 41 in Grundig, the Court of Justice was saying that legislation containing a retrospective limitation period without a transitional provision could be retrospective, could, re could be retrospectively effective, provided that what amounted to an effective transitional period was accorded by the member state, so that it was for the member state to determine how and when it accorded such a period and what such a period was provided that the community law principles of effectiveness, legitimate expectation, and certainty were satisfied. And then turning, please, to paragraph 96. Having rejected the Commissioner's primary case, it's necessary to consider a number of different possible periods of disapplication which have been identified. However, before considering the appropriate characterization of the disapplication period, one must, I think there's a missing word, I or one must deal with another argument raised by the Commission. They contend that only those people who could and would have made claims during the transitional period, but 
which ought to have been but was not accorded in May 97, should be entitled to raise claims during the period of this application, whenever, whatever it is determined to be. And then Lord Newberger explains um, why he rejects that. Um, and then at top of 98, a number of different possible dates were suggested as the start of the disapplication period, or to be strictly accurate, the start of the end of the disapplication period. I've, I, I've tried to unpick what he means by that. I think what he means by that is that um, the, the very beginning of the disapplication period is the period from when all those whose claim disappeared in the puff of smoke started to have claims. So in the VAT context, 1973 onwards. I think that must be what he means. And then he goes through all of that. And then, again, in a passage that we didn't look at before, paragraph 104. In my opinion, <coughs> the period of disapplication, or to be strictly accurate, the beginning of the end of the period of disapplication, has not yet arisen. Subject to one point, I would have thought that it would be a matter for Parliament to legislate prospectively for a specific transitional period or for the commissioners to communicate in clear terms a final period during which claims for input tax arising before the 1st of May 1997 could be made. That is as clear an indication as possible that you've got what is being referred to as accrued claims. As I said before, we saw from the speech of Lord Scott He and what well, must infer the rest of their lordships were plainly aware of the tail end of the Conde now. Um, plain. Can I, with that in mind, address my learned friend's submission that Fleming is not determinative? Because even though Mr. Vider, um, as he then was, announced, or rather advanced several different analyses, I think four in total, as to the appropriate period of disapplication none of which were accepted by the majority. There was a further argument which could have been advanced based on what Mr. Baldry now says is the distinction between claims involving accrued rights that were immediately lost on the 8th of May 97 and claims involving accrued rights which, as at the 8th of May 97, had some time, a day, a week, a month, a year, three years, to run before the end of a new three-year time limit. Uh, as my lords will have appreciated, our primary answer to that is that it's inconsistent with the binding ratio of Fleming. In reality, what Mr. Baldry is inviting you to do is to depart from Fleming, to hold it was wrongly decided for the category of claims at the end of the Condé Nast timeline. My lords, there is no principle in the doctrine of stare decisis which says that once you have identified the ratio of a case which covers its facts, you can depart from that because there was a different, less ambitious, more nuanced argument that could have been advanced, but which was not. And with thanks to my learned co-leader, who dug this up overnight, <laughs> and I hand up authority for that proposition. So, I mean, the burden of your submission will be, this is something for the Supreme Court, not for us. Well, Although the burden of my submission means I win. <laughs> <laughs> it also means you win, but yes. <laughs> um, um, th this was a case called Duke and Reliance System. Judgment of Sir John Donaldson, Master of the Rolls, with whom Lord Justices Ralph Gibson and, and Bingham, as he then was, agreed. In summary, it's a thankfully short judgment. The issue in that case concerned the meaning of certain words in the Sex Discrimination Act 1975. The difficulty for the appellant in that case was that there had been a previous decision of the Court of Appeal on the same issue of statutory interpretation. But Mr. Panic and Mr. Lester, Mr. Lester and Mr. Panic, 
sought to argue that that decision by the Court of Appeal should not be followed because the court in the earlier case had not been referred to various provisions of the treatment directive and various arguments as to statutory construction based upon those provisions. Um, the appeal was dismissed. Can I show you, please, just one passage at the end of the judgment of the Master of the Rolls, page 113 of the Queen's Bench Report. So this is in part of the judgment where he identifies the various arguments relied upon by Mr. Lester and Mr. Panic, all based upon um, the directive, some of which he appeared to be attracted to and some of which he said were less attractive. But that wasn't the answer. He says at letter B, however that may be, as far as I'm concerned, the problem and the insuperable problem faced by Mr. Lester is provided by a previous decision of this court in Roberts and Cleveland Area Health Authority where this court decided that section 6.4 was to be construed as meaning about and not consequence upon. I therefore ask myself how we can escape from that conclusion without doing violence to the very valuable doctrine of stare decisis. It is suggested that this is a case of per incurian in the sense that the court which decided the Roberts case did not have this directive or any community law brought to its attention. I have always understood that the doctrine of per incurian only applies where another division of this court has reached a decision in the absence of knowledge of a decision binding upon it or a statute and that in either case, it has to be shown that the court had this material, it must have reached a contrary decision. That is per incurian. I do not understand the doctrine to extend to a case where if different arguments had been placed before it, or if different material had been placed before it, it might have reached a different conclusion. That's essentially Mr. Baldry's submission. If only Mr. Vida had come up with this new argument that Mr. Baldry has identified, um, the House of Lords would have decided the case differently to the tail end of the Commonwealth today, but they did not. I've certainly come across, I mean, maybe the cases I was in were themselves per incurian, but I've certainly come across cases where the Court of Appeal reached a different view on exactly the same issue of law uh, and felt free to depart from an earlier decision of the Court of Appeal because the argument hadn't been made. Maybe they were wrong to do so. Well, can I just give you an example? Because it may be that I can be put right. In, uh, I'm sorry to, to, to give you an example off the top of my head, but it's because you've just raised this issue with us. Um, in around 2006, there's a decision of the Court of Appeal called Elias. You may remember it. Do. Yeah. Um, the background to that was that there's been an earlier case called Absypher in which exactly the same issue of law had arisen, but it hadn't been argued under the Race Relations Act. Uh, we argued it under the Race Relations Act. And the Court of Appeal said, I've come is different. But, I mean, I'd have to refresh my memory, my lord, but it might be that the relief you were seeking was relief under the Race Relations Act rather than as a matter no, of... I, I can't, I can't. It was, it was, no, it was an application for judicial <coughs> review, but it, right. it, it, may, it may be distinguishable, but I, just, I don't want you... In, if, if it's not relevant, then we shall be told that, perhaps tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But in case it does have any bearing on this question, since you've raised this point... Well, I've raised it to, because... Well, I, I, I'm not, I'm not criticising. I, I, I'm just explaining why I've only just remembered <coughs> Elias. It's because you've just raised this point. <laughs> and, and for what it's worth, I asked um, Mr Jones to see whether this case had been cited since, to which the answer is yes, generally, but not specifically on the argument point, but more on the... Yes. Uh, well, material. Well, yeah, well, yeah, I can understand perhaps, that. Perhaps one should add this. I mean, there may be a distinction between cases where the issue is whether the Court of Appeal is free to depart from one of its own previous decisions, yes. which means coming within one of the Young and Bristol Aeroplane exceptions. None of which. And the much starker proposition which is, here. This is the which House is, of so it's, it's the House of Lords. With great respect, I would agree. Um, that was going to be my next submission. Yeah, the next, I mean, the, the question conventionally, surely, is it's House of Lords. What is the ratio? We are bound by it. Indeed. And we can say we don't like it, and we can even give permission to appeal. But, I mean, we're bound by it. But that, that's why, um, I, I hope not adventitiously, <laughs> I started my submissions today by identifying what we say is the binding Absolutely. issue of the House well, of Lords. Absolutely. Rightly, I may say so, yeah. And, and can I just make one last point on, on Mr. Baldry's argument? And, and, I'm, and I'm sorry to descend to a jury point, but it is a jury point, and I'll make it anyway. Uh, um, it would be surprising 
if there was an obvious answer to the tail end of the Condé Nast claim, which Mr. Vider, having identified four different possible ways of disapply, um, section 320, all of which would have saved various aspects of the defense of the claim, did not alight upon this one. Maybe that's not a very powerful point. I don't think that's your best point. No, of course. <laughs> well, I, 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 think, I think, as my Lord has said, the traditional understanding of what the ratio of a case is, is what is the legal principle which explains the outcome. Yes. And, and you very clearly pointed out to us that the outcome in uh, Fleming was not just Fleming's case, but the Condé Nast case. And, well, we'll have to hear submissions in reply on how the outcome in Condé Nast can be explained, other than uh, that the limitation period could not be applied. I, I would respect it, which is why I said essentially Mr. Baldry, although he doesn't say so expressly, has to say that that part of the Fleming decision is wrong, if he's right. Which he can say to us while recognizing we're bound by it. Yes. Well, of course, it was reserving the right to that's take it further in due course. But I mean, that's can only take each stage as it comes. Well, has to, yeah. Um, can I then um, deal with um, FII, um, um, particularly FII in the Court of Justice, at Volume 2, Tab 13? Of course, did itself consider the lawfulness of Section 320. Um, I recognise, and this is the point made by Mr. Ewart to the Chancellor in the Class 8 case, that on the facts of FIR, all of the Aegis claims were disappeared into a puff of smoke by <coughs> Section 320. So the fact pattern is not the same as Fleming. And the fact pattern, or rather Condé now, and the fact pattern isn't the same as here. So um, there's a limit to what reliance I can place on FII in the Court of Justice. But I do say that it elucidates again the same general principles that um, were understood and applied by the House of Lords and Fleming. And that nothing in the Court of Justice's judgment in FII is in any way supportive of Mr. Baldry's argument. Um, if we start, please, with paragraph 37. Paragraph 37 is essentially a recapitulation of MNS paragraph 38. Um, in the first sentence, court states the general principle, which is that there must be a condition that the new legislation includes transitional arrangements, allowing an adequate period for lodging claims for repayments which persons were entitled to submit under the previous legislation. That's a clear statement of principle. Such transitional arrangements are necessary, this is echoing MNS, where the immediate application to those claims of a limitation period is shorter than that which was previously enforced would have the effect of retroactively depriving some individuals of their right to repayment. Um, well, with, with respect, that, that is the hard case. Section 320 did precisely that. It's the puff of smoke category. Or of allowing them too short a period for asserting that right. Again, that's this case. There is a category of people who have too short a period of time. Then what follows from that? It follows that national legislation curtailing retroactively and without any transitional arrangements the period within which repayment could be sought of sums collected in breach of EU law is incompatible with the principle of effectiveness. <coughs> and then, moving on, at paragraph 44, should be recalled that according to the subtle case law, the principle of legal certainty, the corollary of which is the principle of the protection of legitimate expectations, requires that rules involving negative consequences for individuals should be clear and precise, and that their application should be predictable for those subject to them. Whether you, you, You've got to know whether you, you've got a day, a week, a month, six months, or longer. Paragraph 
over the page, top of 1187 of the report, as has been observed in para 33, limitation periods must be fixed in advance if they are to serve their purpose of ensuring legal certainty. And that echoes what was said in Fleming, but so do transitional periods. So, uh, again, I, I've, made, I've, I've accepted, um, as I have to, that because of the fact pattern in FII and the Aegis claims that it disappeared in a puff of smoke, the Court of Justice did not specifically address this situation, but it laid down general principles, all of which are consistent with what I Can I then deal um, briefly with, first of all, the judge's reasoning in this case, and with the Chancellor's reasoning in the class of case? Um, just to be clear, we are inviting this court to dismiss the revenues appeal on the Section 320 point from the judge's holding that Section 320 must be disapplied for all claims where the payments were made before the 8th of September 2003. And I'll show you the passage where he makes that holding. Of course, I accept, there is no doubt, that in several paragraphs of his reasoning, the judge went further than we would submit as necessary or, indeed, than we were arguing, in referring to the fact that one feature of Section 320's operation, which he regarded as unfair, was that taxpayers were in reality deprived of their accrued rights without even appreciating that those rights existed, let alone that they'd been deprived of them. That is obviously the part of the judgment which the crown skeleton here focuses on most, and indeed is the only part of the reasoning that was criticised by the Chancellor in Class A. But the fact that the judge went further than he needed to in our respectful submission does not mean his ultimate conclusion was wrong in law. Can I just take you to the judgment? Just before you do that, yes. so does it follow from that submission that for you to win on this point, yes. you do not need to satisfy us that the Chancellor was wrong? Can I answer that question, my Lord, when I take you to the Chancellor's yes, of course. judgment? Yes, yeah, of course. And, and just to foreshadow something that I'm also going to say, um, um, my Lords may have seen, we have put in a respondent's notice that essentially says, irrespective of whether the, the judge in our case went further than he needed to, this case should be upheld on the basis of the mm. principle I absolutely follow the significance of that. <laughs> uh, but I haven't actually seen the respondents lately. Yes. Can I show it to you? It's, um, oh, I see. So it's tab four. So I should have seen the respondents lately. And in fact, it looks as though I did at some stage to see it. See it, but I have forgotten about it. Yes. Um, I'm <coughs> yes. Does that answer my Lord's yes. query? Um, <coughs> so just, just picking up the judgment. Mr. Justice Marcus Smith. Um, tab 9. If you turn straight to these two paragraphs. sentence. As regards that class of taxpayer having an accrued right to recover money mistakenly paid pursuant to an unlawfully levied demand of the tax, the legal regime changes without notice from one day to the next. And that is just as true for those who've lost their claims altogether in a puff of smoke as it is for those who have a day, a week, a month, etc. And then at paragraph 
98, he says, as regards what is described above as hidden retrospectivity, there was no transitional provision at all. The issue went unaddressed. And then at paragraph 100, Roman numeral 7, page 158. It's true that in the first sentence, the judge refers to the basic fact that the taxpayer has a claim that he knows nothing about. But he says the only remedy that will sufficiently protect the rights that have accrued already is to exclude from section 320 those accrued rights. And I say that holding applies on Fleming, irrespective of the claimant's knowledge or ignorance of its cause of action. And the judge's fixation, if I can call it that, with hidden retrospectivity, seems to me it doesn't, I mean, if, if it's mistaken, that does really affect the whole of his reasoning. On the other hand, the appeal is against his order rather than his reasoning. Well, so yes. that's really the point you're making. Which is why we put in a response. Yes, indeed. <coughs> this phrase, hidden retrospectivity, had that, had that appeared anywhere else in the learning? Not the, no, I think it's a, a judicial construct. Yes, but a judicial construct in this case only. I, I think that's right. Yes. Yes. I mean, I, I don't want to be too um, impolite, but um, my lords know that that, that, that was I mean, certainly the relevance of knowledge. And I don't want to um, blame the judge too much. The relevance of the claimant not knowing that he's got a right featured <laughs> in our um, arguments on uh, the second limb, issue 9b, for the payments that were not accrued by those payments that were made after the coming into force of Section 320, but where we essentially say, well, we know we can't win at this stage, or indeed in the Court of Appeal. We've got to preserve our position yeah. because of the effect of Leeds City Council yeah. uh, for the Supreme <coughs> Court. But I didn't submit that that was the answer to the earlier period. I, I, I don't think it matters in terms of the submissions that are being presented to us, but uh, the judge has obviously derived his distinction from Jowett uh, yes, references that we see in paragraph 88. Yes. Um, so can I then turn to briefly address the Chancellor's judgment in class A? Tab 6 of the authorities. Answer my Lord Lord Justice Singh's question. We, we do go so far as to submit that, insofar as it considered Section 320, the judge was wrong. Uh, the Chancellor was wrong, primarily because he failed to identify and then apply the ratio of flame. In other words, he failed to distinguish. Is this right, or between, or rather, he? No, I'm sorry. Right. Saying it's wrong, and he, he treated accrued cases in the same way as ones which disappeared in a puff of smoke. Disappeared in a puff of smoke. Yes, exactly. When you say he shouldn't have done that, um, the, the right has, I mean, no, just to be sorry. clear, that, that he, he, my lord has got it right with respect. Oh, right. Uh, um, uh, the, the right has accrued, yes, as at the new date of the new transitional provision, 8th of May 97, or yes, 8th of September 2000. Three, because at that stage, let's fix on Paul what the right is. A money has been paid to the state by the taxpayer. Yes. And although they didn't know it at the time, that money was paid under a mistake of law, and therefore they had, as at that moment, a right to recover it. Yeah. And that was an that was an accrued right. That can be the only meaning. You, you can't define whether a right is accrued by whether it's disappeared. I bet my. You can't define whether a yeah. right is an accrued right by whether or not it later disappears. Yeah, well, quite. But surely in a restitutionary claim for a payment of tax exacted under a legislative provision which is unlawful, yes, the cause of action accrues at the time of payment of the tax. Precisely so. Mm. Yeah. Well, 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 why isn't that a point against you? Because, why? Well, well, because you, you, you've accepted that in principle a state can have a limitation period let's say six years, yes. from the date of action 
of the course of action accruing. Yes, but if, you, if your right has accrued um, uh, such that you've only got one day on the coming into force. No, I understand that yeah. point. But knowledge isn't relevant. Knowledge no, is I agree. Right, well, why, why are you saying the Chancellor's wrong then? Because that's what he said. Well, let, 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 can I show you? My All right. <coughs> I think it's, in fairness to Mr. Baldry, he made clear that most, most of this judgment is not dealing with Section 320 at all, but with a, a large number of other questions, one of which was uh, um, whether there had been a statutory ouster of the claimant's claims uh, um, by requiring them to claim their claim through Section 790 uh, uh, under the double taxation. Yes, which the judge held that, held there had been such an ouster. Indeed. So what he said on 320 was overture. What he A, what he said on 320 and, was overture. And also arose from submissions made after his draft judgment had been circulated. M my Lord has many of the points I'm yes. going to m make in a second. But, Sorry. But, but, no, 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 I'm not, that's not a complaint. <laughs> uh, um, can I just show you where, and I think Mr. Baldry showed you this already, but very briefly. The ouster question is identified on page 5139 of the report, 287 of the bundle. under the heading of paragraph 51.6 issue. So the, the Chancellor says, as already indicated, the party's argument on paragraph 51.6, that's paragraph 51.6 of Schedule 18 of the Finance Act 2004, passed like ships in the night. The basic question is, of course, whether that paragraph operates so as to oust the claimant's common law claims. It will operate in that way unless it falls foul of the EU law principle of effectiveness. The issue is therefore whether it makes it impossible in practice or excessively difficult for the claimants <coughs> to exercise their San Giorgio right to recover overpaid tax. And then he identifies various sub-issues, um, the first three of which are not relevant to the present context. The fourth of which is, is the relief, either the relief by claiming double taxation allowed by Section 790, prevented from being effective because in some cases, the claimants can show they didn't actually know they had such a remedy before the abbreviated limitation period under that provision meant that their remedy had become statute barred. So it, the focus there is entirely on um, the part of, or the question about awareness. But it also does refer to limitation. It, it does, but can I show you how the G Chancellor deals with that? You then turn forward to page 290 of the bundle. I'm not going to read it all out, but, uh, but, but at paragraphs 85 all the way through to 97, um, we see Mr. Aronson for the claimant inviting the Chancellor to follow the, that feature of the Jazz-Tel reasoning, which I don't seek to uphold, at least in this court, concerning the relevance of knowledge. So he says, Mr. Aronson submits that I should follow the decision of Mr. Justice Marcus Smith and Jazz Tell, so as to decide that a claimant who doesn't know that a remedy is available to him cannot have an adequate and effective remedy for the purposes of EU law. And then the Chancellor goes through the judgment, identifying what he showed Marcus Smith thought to be the real mischief. And then he says, in the last sentence of paragraph 88, having cited the Court of Justice decision in FII, the knowledge of the claimant as to the existence of the claim is nothing to the point. Then he cites Fleming, and then he says what these authorities did not say is that the limitation period could only be attenuated when the claimant is shown to have known that he or she had an accrued right in question. But none of that is grappling with what I say is the binding ratio of Fleming. Mm. And then um, when he comes finally... Did, did, sorry, did, sorry, do you accept the first sentence of paragraph 90 is inconsistent with your case? No, I don't accept that. Well, well if it's not, then, then it doesn't really matter whether it's right or wrong, because you can win anyway. So I, thought, I thought point you point. were saying that he's wrong in that sentence uh, because it's inconsistent. No, I'm not saying he's wrong in that sentence. I'm going to show you where I, I do see. say All right, okay. So we it's at the end of the judgment where he goes wrong, isn't it? When, exactly when, he, when so. he states his conclusions exactly. in various summary form. Exactly so. And in particular, on, uh, in section... In 124. 
or sorry, yeah, yes, more exactly more. so. Yeah. It's 122 to 124. Yeah. Yes. Um, where he's, he, he essentially adds little to the reasoning that he's already, he said, he's basically, well, I've, I've covered all this already in fixing, in fixating upon, or fixing upon, the relevance or irrelevance of the knowledge question. Um, uh, he says, I've already said I'm unable to agree with Marcus Smith, Miss Justice Marcus Smith in Jasdell, when he held that the legislature's ability to deprive taxpayers of an existing claim to recover over the tax, depending on whether those taxpayers knew that they had such a claim. In these circumstances, in my judgment, Section 320 was effective to remove common law claims for restitution. Um, with great respect, that is a legal non sequitur because it ignores the binding effect of, of, of Fleming. And then again, he just simply repeats the point in paragraph 124. Accordingly, the answer to the third issue is that Section 320 has effect from the 22nd of July, whether the claim relates to tax paid before or after the 8th of September 2003. And I do say, my lord, that is wrong. After a judgment, after a draft was provided, the claimant sought to re-argue this issue by referring to the decision in FIR as to the reasons why the issue should be answered differently, whether or not Jastel was correct. As Mr. Ewart submitted, however, the claims in that uh, case were claims in relation to tax paid more than six years before. And Mr. Ewart was correct to submit that, but that wasn't the answer. Um, it was those claims which had been removed by Section 320 with immediate effect and without the transitional provision. In this case, the argument is about whether Section 320 was effective to remove claims that had accrued before the legislation took effect but in respect of which a part of the limitation period had still to run when the legislation took effect. The claimants in argued in Jazztown meant that 320 wasn't compliant with EU law because of its hidden restrictivity. Uh, no, we didn't, but I'm not criticising the Chancellor for thinking that we had. Uh, I, the taxpayer, might not have known that it had such a claim before they were removed. It is that argument that I have held to be wrong. And we would say, yes, but that, that misses the point of Fleming. Did the Chancellor address Fleming? He mentioned it in his judgment. He just yes. didn't identify what the ratio was. And I would say that's Can you error. remind us where he does that? Well, he mentions it um, in paragraph 89. Thank you. It's an astonishingly comprehensive judgment. I mean, it covers an immense amount of helpful material. And it is. And there's background. a lot of, you know, we can all miss it. I'm sorry that this sounds a bit glib. One well, can all miss a trick. Home I mean, and if, it, if it was an oversight, it was a very small one at the very end of an incredibly long judgment. And the passage that was obiter, as I was saying earlier. And he, anyway, he, he does. He goes beyond that on Fleming. I've forgotten mm. where it is. Yes. Yes. Well, he, he, he mentions Fleming. He, he, he cites from Fleming 66. in 66 and 67. Yes. Yeah. He doesn't. He doesn't refer to Lord Hope or Lord Scott or Lord Carswell. But he does appear to be accepting in substance the argument that we've heard. Mm. Well, I'm not, it's not no. clear to me how Mr. Yeah, Hewitt... It's not binding on us. <laughs> no, no, I understand mm. that. And, and we've heard, you say, we've certainly heard fuller argument, and, and, and we should depart from what the Chancellor said to that <coughs> extent. I would mm. respectfully agree. Right. Um, my Lords, I, I want to turn around for a second, but I think that's what I want to say on Section 320. And I guess at some point, are you, going, you weren't planning to take us to Leeds at any point, were you? I mean, I, well, uh, I guess um, one or two side questions about, well, about I'm happy Leeds. to Not that I'm seeking to go into, you know, and I, I, un, as I understand it, there's no issue about the payments 9 to 23 in, in this court. That's correct. And it's, it's common ground that Leeds is binding on us or what it decides. It's I just as one, just one passage. I, yes, can I, I have a question about yes, it. Yes, I would be just might have some tangential relevance. Tab 5. Tab 5. Is it a question about paragraph? <coughs> well, I'll ask it like well it's question. a question about paragraph 22. Oh, okay. I think in particular, where, um, sorry, I'm now losing my own track. But that's right, there's a reference here in, the, in Lord Justice Lewison's discussion of the relevant principles of law, and he boils them all down to says it's all things are rather simple now. But it, the context is he appears to be talking, before you get to the paragraph 22, about um, Fleming. Indeed, he's explicitly referring to Fleming in 21, Fleming at 79, Lord Newberger distilled yes. a number of propositions. 
In Ig is on in 22, the expression transitional period may be misleading in some circumstances. What is really an issue is a prospective period from the date of the legislative change in which a valid claim may be made. And he then says in 153, Lord Sumption put it thus. But, I mean, that's not a reference to Fleming. Yeah, that's a reference, that's a reference to FII. To FII. Um, I think that's the reference to FII in 2012 when they refer the matter to the Court of precisely. Justice. Precisely. So it's before you get the latest guidance from the ECJ, if it Indeed. matters, in Fleming ECJ. But also, I'm interested by the way where Lord Sumption ends the passage of quotation. Legislation curtailing limitation periods is in principle consistent with the principle of effectiveness, provided that a period of grace, which may be quite short, is allowed either by giving sufficient advance notice of the change or by including transitional provisions. Now, we've seen lots of authorities saying you have to have transitional provisions, but I'm puzzled by the preceding, either by giving sufficient advance notice of the change. Well, uh, I mean, in Fleming itself, there was a discussion about whether the um, announcement of the transitional yes. period had to be in legislation. Oh, I see. Or could be announced by the commissioners by way of a revenue by way of a business brief, brief or something. Properly dissemin disseminate. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see. Is that really that's what the reference is? I think so. Yes, yes thank you. That's... So the crucial point, I think, in that context being the promulgation point. Quite. Indeed. So yes. the form of the instrument doesn't necessarily matter, but what is crucial is public accessibility. Yes. And the need Pro for provided that the revenue and customs brief is properly promulgated and intra vires. Yes. Then it may serve the same function as um, uh, legislation, which is deemed to be brought to everyone's attention. Yeah, whether exactly. his or not. Exactly. Mm. But it's uh, still um, got to be advance notice. It's advance you, notice. You don't satisfy advance notice by an, an announcement today. You're going to legislate in 18 months' time with effect from today. Yes, exactly. That's not advance notice at all. Exactly. That's what you have in m &S, That's what we have in the present case. Yes, ma'am. And you say you don't have advance notice by enacting legislation, which... Uh, it ad, on an ad hoc basis, in later cases, uh, courts are called upon to decide whether there was a reasonable period of transition. My Lord, exactly so. Yeah. Um, I know that you're about to finish on Section 320, but are you going to make any submissions to us about ICI and well, I, the liberty? Uh, um, before, before my, my um, Lord sent the request this morning, I looked at ICI last night, uh, um, and maybe that I've missed something. It didn't seem to be anything that was said. Um, from the front of me. Is it somewhere? Okay, shall, shall, I, shall I just tell you what the problem might be? Yes. And then you can explain to us what the answer is. Well, can I do, before my Lord does that, can I just see if I can get my copy of ICI? Of course. Yes. Can, can I just check? I, there's activity on the other side that may mean that there are copies of these authorities. Oh, if so, okay. it might be best to have them now. I think the passage that my Lord, Lord Justice Thank Singh you. mentioned earlier is on the last page of, no, the penultimate page of the report, exactly. the speech of Lord Nona. Exactly, okay. that's right. Yeah. The, the point is that it remains the law, and it remained the law throughout our membership of the European Union, that courts in this country do not have the power to strike down acts of parliament. So when, in order to give effect to the will of Parliament in the 1972 Act, courts occasionally did have to <coughs> disapply even primary legislation, it appears that they were very careful in that exercise. They were still not striking down legislation as such. What they were doing was disapplying primary legislation to the extent that that was required in order to give effect to directly effective EU rights. And can I just, sorry to interrupt my lord, yes. and, and, and the disapplication in our case, just to be absolutely clear, is necessary for all claimants with accrued rights, yes. not just because of the principle of effectiveness, yes. but also because of the principle of legal certainty. Yes. That, 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 that you say that's the answer. That's the answer. Yeah. But do you accept 
the the proposition that it, it therefore could be in principle that primary legislation can be applied compatibly with EU law on certain fact situations where it could not be applied compatibly with EU law on other fact situations. I mean, I don't, <coughs> I don't want to appear non-committal, but I'm also conscious <coughs> of the possibility that this case might go higher. Uh, um, and the, in the event that there's some conflict between Fleming and what my lord has just said, and I don't, I don't submit that there is, no, I, one, I one, one might have to grapple with my lord's question. I, I understand. Well, well it, it might be said, and I don't know, which is why we've raised this for council to assist us with. It might be said that ICI is an example of where the legislation is not struck down. The legislation is not even said to be incompatible. What happens is that in applying the legislation, you have to look very carefully at the facts of the individual case to see whether applying... This application is necessary. Exactly. And, 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 and actually, ICI, I'm afraid, won a Pyrrhic victory in Luxembourg, because having got the point of EU law determined... They then lost in the House of They lost on the facts of their case. <laughs> My Lord, but of course ICI was not about limitation period. No, I understand. And, and the need for everyone affected by a new provision to understand exactly where they stand. Yes. Which is why I do emphasise, as My Lord appreciates, the yes. principle of legal certainty. And it's that principle that means you can't have, as the Lordship said in Fleming, yes. an ad hoc case-by-case -case application of, a, of an inherent transitional period. Yes, I'm afraid that we've only been given the ICI case. It doesn't matter. Uh, in, in the Liberty Judgment, at paragraph 69, we quote. I suspect that's available too. Oh, that's available as well. <laughs> Apparently, that's available. Well, why don't we have a look at that since I've, since I've raised it? My Lords, would it be appropriate if we, if we hand up uh, the I think that complete might be best. set? We haven't yes, I think that would be the, helpful. Um, uh, in a folder that um, well, we don't, 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 into don't the. Worry about Existing folders. <laughs> yeah. you've had the opportunity to look at this. I'm case. sorry. Well, well, well if you haven't, then I, I, don't think, I don't think it's fair for me to ask you questions about it. I'm sorry. Just over lunchtime, I was thinking no, 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 about no, other right. issues. You, you, you must have the opportunity. I don't think it'll say anything. It's paragraph 58 to 69. 58 to 69. Yeah. I don't think it says anything with which you would disagree, but I do want you to have the opportunity before this hearing finishes to tell us if you do disagree. Well, I'm grateful, and I'll look at it overnight and let you know why. Okay. Thank you. Just, just <coughs> coming back a moment. Um, my Lord asked you about uh, whether Section 320 continued to apply to an extent, even on your case. In one sense, the answer to that is yes, because plainly you don't quarrel with its application domestically. I can't. No. So, so it is the case that regardless of uh, whether you're right or wrong in your submissions, Section 320 still stands on its own construction whatever it means, in relation to domestic matters. You mean where EU law... Where EU law doesn't, doesn't feature. We, we don't blue pencil Section 320 no, in any that way. Must be, that must be right. Mm. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, if Leeds is right, it applies where there's a, an international element too. I'm not sure I follow the question. If Leeds I'm is not right, quite sure I worked out the question. <laughs> but um, uh, there's a, on any view, there's a limit to any blue penciling. You don't um, blue pencil at all in relation to domestic matters. You don't blue pencil in relation to domestic matters. You don't blue pencil. Um, um, <coughs> well, you do blue pencil. In, we, the, the common ground is you blue pencil 
for everybody who's claimed disappear in a puff of smoke. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, 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 the debate is whether you blue pencil for the period for everybody else with accrued rights. Yeah. Uh, um, or a subset of them. Um, if so, how that subset. So we don't right. blue pencil this thesis. There's people who haven't yet got accrued rights who make payments. No, pay, payment, pay, mm -hmm. or, or, until we get to the Supreme Court. At this level, no one's inviting you to blue pencil for, for payments of SDRT made after the 8th of September 2003. But you are reserving the right to revisit that. I am. If this case goes higher. I am. Yeah. Presumably on the footing that the same reasoning should apply unless and until there's an adequate transitional provision. Well, and and because of the, the facts identified by the judge in this case. Mm. Uh, which has been referred to in many previous cases, albeit now held against by, by Leeds, mm. of the inherent unfairness of being deprived of a right before you ever knew you had it. But that's just a function of what limitation periods mm. can and often do. Well, right, is it not? domestically, yes, but there may be an argument that the principle of effectiveness doesn't. I, mean, I, I know what mm. my friend says about Caterpillar, and I really don't want to have an argument about that now. <laughs> yes. But or I shouldn't have started. No, no, no. That <laughs> So you're passing to section 32. I am. <coughs> uh, you're presumably making very good progress. I um, am. I mean, I'm um, at the risk of pushing my luck. I'm very, I'm happy to start now. I'm happy to have a break now and start tomorrow morning. I will be done by the end of the day, in fact, well before the end of the day, in any event. Um, and when you say the end of the day, you mean tomorrow, not today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I shan't be <laughs> finished by the end of the day. Um, uh, I think if it's convenient, Mr. Kuczynski, we'd probably rather press on. Yep. But we certainly wouldn't want you to finish tonight. Oh, no, I'm not. Even if you wanted me to, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, can I deal first, please, with the application to advance the new ground yep. of appeal? My learned friend has already taken you to the part of the majority judgment of Lord Reed and Todd and FII dealing with the principles. Can I just take you back to it? It's tab eight. And in particular, um, it's their citation with approval of the Court of Appeals decision in Singh and Das. The second of the three Sorry, principles. I do, I, yeah, no, I have course, But the second of the three principles that's most at play in the current case. And then I'd also draw your attention, although I think we've looked at it already, to the guidance in paragraph 93, and in the last sentence where the majority say, in normal litigation, the need for a retrial would be a strong and normally determinative pointer against allowing a party to withdraw a concession, which would influence the way in which litigation has been conducted. Um, my friend says, well, on, in FII, of course, they were given permission, and the revenues now say they rely on much the same factors in this case, but in my respectful submission, the factors do not apply in the same way. Um, first of all, um, at paragraph 94, Lord Reed and Hodge said, um, the court is being asked to exercise a discretion, not in an individual case, but in the context of a GLO. And it's important to appreciate that in FII, there were no facts on which the House of Lords could make a decision one way or the other as to the application of the test, namely the test as they had identified it as to what discovery or reasonable discoverability means. So it was remittal or nothing in that case. In this case, um, 
the date when JazTel discovered its mistake obviously cannot be a GLO issue, it's a JazTel specific issue. So the subjective lim is a JazTel specific issue. And as I'll come on to submit later today and tomorrow, we say that on the findings of fact made by the judge concerning JazTel's state of mind at all times until March 2009, when it stopped paying, namely that its predominant state of mind was that the tax was lawfully due. As I'll develop in due course, we said that is inconsistent with Jazdell having discovered the mistake, applying the Supreme Court. I know it's a lot of battleground there, but that would be our submission. Now, of course, as to the objective limit, what could a reasonably diligent claimant have discovered? There are no findings of fact made by the judge because his attention was simply not directed to that question. And that would, as the Supreme Court made abundantly clear, entail the need for further evidence concerning the evolving state of legal understanding of how various principles of EU law based on treaties, directives, etc. applied to the SDRT regime under the Finance Act 1986 and then specifically how that applied to various categories of share transactions issues, swaps transfers in and out of the UK, in and out of the EU, American depository receipts, etc., etc. Well, I quite follow that in another case affected by this GLO, that might be necessary. Well, I'm going to be but submitting... On Mr. Baldry's case, it's not necessary here because we don't look at all at what the general understanding of the law was. Well, in my respectful submission, his submission, in, insofar as his submission is the subjective limb is satisfied by the Linklater's advice and the submission of the claim, he's wrong for the reasons I will develop, and either my lords accept that or don't. But I'm not going to start running ahead of myself now. Yes. On the objective limb, um, it, it can, and again, I am going to run ahead of myself a little bit, um, we will submit it cannot possibly be that because one solicitor identifies the possibility of an argument that years later is established to be correct and says, well, if you want to pursue this, you might want to investigate further. Unless we know what that further investigation would have revealed, it might have revealed, for example, if they'd have gone to see counsel, and to make clear they didn't, but if they'd gone to see counsel and they'd taken a second opinion from, I don't know, Freshfields or Norton Rose or Herbert Smith or whomever, but the unanimous view of the legal community at that point is, well, this is a possible claim, but it's very unlikely to succeed on the current state of the law. And, and in those circumstances, my respectful submission would be applying the true test identified say the true test, the test identified by the Supreme Court, that the reasonable diligence test would not have been satisfied. I'm going to have to, again, make submissions yes. on, mm -hmm. on the formulation of is it enough to start an investigation? And I'll be submitting that it can't be enough simply to say, well, I wonder what the answer is. I better ask my solicitor. If the solicitor then says, you've got no claim, time can't begin to run. If the solicitor says, you've got a, there's an argument here, but it's very unlikely to succeed, again, my submission tomorrow will be, time can't begin to run. So to, to answer the objective limb, you've got to answer the question, what would the general body of legal opinion have been at that stage? And that is only a point that can be decided by remittal. So either, and, and, and if remittal is necessary, then either they shouldn't be given permission to run the point at all, or if they are, then, well, we'll have to see what 
court eventually finds on the evidence. But you, what I'm what, what yes. I'm saying is, you you cannot lawfully, in my respectful submission, find against us on the objectively without a remittal. You could find against us. Um, I'm saying you, you shouldn't, but you could, at the level of principle, find against us on the subjective limb without a remittal. So, as uh, in relation to the objective limb, we couldn't do you down without a remittal, and the very fact that a remittal would be needed means that uh, Mr. Baldry shouldn't be allowed to run that's that my, part of the case. That, that's my submission. Just on that point, that, that last point, could it be said that this isn't a typical sort of sing and das kind of situation? Because in the meantime, what's happened is that the Supreme Court has given its judgment departing from an earlier House of Lords decision. Well, my Lord, I, I, I accept that to, to stated in those terms. I'm not suggesting that court contemplated in Singh and Das for the situation that we're dealing with today. But uh, it, it, it's important that in granting permission in FII at paragraph 95, Lords Reed and Hodge said, because Klein, Watt, Benson and DMG were ruling by the House of Lords, the revenue couldn't have mounted this challenge in the courts below. The revenue could only have given notice that such a challenge might have been made. And if such a challenge had been given, how far would the BAT claimants have acted differently? Because that's the test in Singh and Das. And then they say, well, it's a matter of spec. This is at paragraph 97. They say it's a matter of speculation how they might have acted differently. But in that context, we are in a slightly different position. I'll explain why. In the present case, the revenue advanced a change of position defense. On the state of the law as it stood, that defence was doomed to fail. It, they, they had to go to the Supreme Court to make it good as a matter of law, just as they have to go to the Supreme Court in this case, had to go to the Supreme Court in this case, to make good their new point on Section 36 and why DMG was wrongly decided. Um, but we had a trial on the facts. Indeed, we had quite a lot of expert evidence on fiscal spending and w whether X hundred million pounds worth of SDRT had any impact on borrowing, had any impact on... Well, there was quite a lot of evidence, fact and expert evidence, on that very issue. All notwithstanding the fact that the revenue accepted, they had to have a change in the law for them to make their defence good at all. They could have done exactly the same thing in relation to their new 32-1C point. And we've taken that point in our skeleton argument. And I noticed that Mr Baldry offered no explanation as to why they couldn't and shouldn't have done the same thing. I mean, we don't know when the new point first occurred to the revenue. I mean, it must have first occurred to them at some stage. Um, but nonetheless, if they could identify and promote or advance their change of position defence at the trial in front of Mr Justice Marcus Smith in 2017, even though they knew they had to have a, a change at the level of the Supreme Court for it to win, they could and should have done the same thing, and we could then have uh, adduced evidence going to the issues that are now before this court. I mean, the reality is what Mr. Baldry is seeking to do is to ask you to make findings of fact, in particular on the objective limb, about the state of mind of, or sorry, about, about what a reasonably diligent uh, claimant must have appreciated, when that matter simply wasn't canvassed in evidence at all below. And as we say further in our skeleton, it is somewhat ironic for the commissioners to say, well, they couldn't have been expected to run this argument at trial, in reality, because we hadn't yet thought of it, when their substantive argument against us is that we should have been expected to identify and run our mistake of law argument years before any court decision suggesting or even reference to the court, suggesting that the SDRT regime was contrary to EU law. Um, so, so they say knowledge is irrelevant in that context, but highly relevant to the exercise of discretion in this context. So in, in my respectful submission, the factors don't operate in the same way, and the position is as I have submitted, and my Lord, Lord Justice, newly encapsulated it.
And, and so to be absolutely clear, and I think you say this in your skeleton, insofar as Mr. Baldry can run his case on the facts that already exist. On the facts as already found by the judge. As already found by, by the judge. Not asking you to make new inferences of fact from the document. Yes, there may be some room <laughs> for, for uh, debate there, but um, uh, broadly, insofar as Mr. Baldry, well, insofar as Mr. Baldry could necessarily succeed without a remittal, do you accept the inevitable uh, that he can run the new point? But if, insofar as uh, there might be a need for a remittal, then he should not be allowed to run the point. Yes. And I do say that in so far as you were minded to find against us on the objective limbs, then you couldn't, you you couldn't do that. would be needed. Exactly so. Yes. Am I with that cleared out of the way? And I'm not going to make any further submissions on the bundles because we, we are where we are. Can I um, now, and I hope this is valuable before we um, move into the judgment, identify what I say are the key submissions and principles that emerge from the Supreme Court's judgment in FIR. Um, the, the first um, is obviously just a statement of the statute. Time begins to run um, under section 32.1c from when a claimant has discovered its mistake or when it could, with reasonable diligence, have discovered the mistake, whichever is the earlier. <coughs> In respect of either limb, the subjective or the objective, the majority of the court has held that a mistake of law is not first discovered or discoverable when a court of final appeal has authoritatively determined the point of law in the claimant's favour. That's the big departure from DMG. Three, rather, the majority has held that time begins to run at the point where a claimant recognises or could, with reasonable diligence, have recognised that it has a, quote, worthwhile claim, close quote, that the payment was made under a mistake of law. That is the standard which must be reached. And as my lords have seen, that formulation is repeated many times in the judgment. And just to give you key references, it's paragraphs 193, 209, 210, 211, 213, and 255. Four, various alternative formulations were also used by Lords Reed and Hodge, in particular the one that my learned friend relies upon about embarking on the preliminaries to the issue of a writ. And I'll come back to that formulation shortly. But in our submission, it is not enough for the standard to be met, for a claimant simply to know that an argument exists that a mistake of law has been made. Parties and their lawyers can often identify the existence 
of a range of possible arguments that could, in theory, be advanced. But that is not enough. L likewise, and I'm still in my proposition four, it is not enough, as the commissioner's skeleton suggests at paragraph 49, that a party entertains, quote, some doubt as to the validity of the tax. Five. Now we're getting to the, <laughs> the meat of the difficulty. For a mistake to have been discovered to the standard of knowing that a worth while claim exists, the party must believe, must believe in the truth of its assertion that the mistake has been made. Because that is an essential element of its claim. Indeed, if he does not have that belief, he could not, for example, properly sign the statement of truth in support of a claim. And that is so whether the claim is one based on mistake of law or mistake of fact or fraud, i.e. irrespective of the different pleading obligations upon the pleader. And you're obviously going to come back to that. I am. Uh, and I say that submission is supported, I'll give you the references and I'll come to them, in particular by paragraphs 181 to 193, 180, 181 to 183, and 196, and I'll come back to them. That's proposition five. I've got two more to go. Six. Where... As in this case, a payment of tax has been made by a corporation or an individual, it matters not, on the understanding that the primary UK legislation was lawful and that understanding is later altered by a subsequent judicial decision. Time will begin to run when the corporation had, and I quote, good grounds for supposing that it had a valid claim to recover the tax as contrary to EU law. So just to repeat, good grounds for supposing that it had a valid claim to recover the tax as contrary to EU law. That's paragraphs 210, 211, and the last sentence of 255. Seven. Where a party pays tax in accordance with domestic legislation which it believes is compatible with EU law. In our submission, it is impossible for it simultaneously to believe that it has a worthwhile claim that the legislation was contrary to EU law. I don't see that that follows at all. There might be all sorts of practical or commercial reasons for why it, it, it doesn't have the second belief. Well, I, I'll come on to what might be meant in, by the word worthwhile, but oh. I'm, not, I'm not for the moment oh. making that submission, I see. focusing on practicalities like, is the defendant solvent? How much tax is at stake? I'm right. making a starker submission. I see. You can't have coexisting in your mind a belief, as the judge found in this case, 
the tax was validly due as a matter of EU law. And at the same time, irrespective of the characteristics of the defendant or irrespective of the characteristics of your own finances and willingness to pursue a claim, etc., you can't simultaneously believe you have a worth. Can I then address, and I hope this is helpful, I know there's a lot of writing, but I'm, I'm laying out my stall before we go to the judgments. Can I then address the alternative formulation in the majority judgment, drawn principally from the earlier case law on the discovery of fraud and mistake of fact? That time starts running from the point where a party I quote, and my lawyers may not want to write it out, but I'm just quoting from the judgment, knows or could with reasonable diligence know that he made a mistake with sufficient confidence to justify embarking on the preliminary to the issue of a writ, such as submitting a claim to the proposed defendant, taking advice, and collecting evidence. My lord's seen that formulation over and over. Um, as to that, we have the following point. First, the court has repeatedly said that this was to be equated to the standard of a claimant knowing that it has a worthwhile claim. It is not intending to lower that standard. Otherwise, there would be worrying policy concerns because it would force claimants into issuing protective claims to stop time running, even though they did not believe that they had a worthwhile claim. Second, as to the step of collecting evidence, while such a step is relevant, in the context of uncovering a mistake of fact or uncovering a claim in fraud. Collecting evidence is a much more limited, is of much more limited assistance. The concept of collecting evidence is of much more limited assistance in the context of a mistake of law. In particular, one which depends upon anticipating what arguments of law courts, including appellate courts and including the Court of Justice, may in due course accept, often years into the future, either in your own case or in cases brought by other litigants in circumstances more or less similar to yours. In, concept of collecting evidence in that category of mistake case is a very limited assistance. As to the preliminary of taking advice, in our submission, it clearly cannot always be enough simply to have got to the stage of taking advice. After all, if the advice is resoundingly negative, in other words, you're being advised either that there is no argument at all, or that such argument as there is, is highly likely or likely to fail, in my respectful submission, you can't be said to know or believe that you have a worthwhile claim. I mean, for what it's worth, nothing may turn on this. In this case, I don't think Jastel sought to link later's advice. Link later's sent him an email saying, we've, we've, we've had an idea here. We don't think it's a very fully developed idea or a very strong idea, but anyway. That's, that's, a, that's a point on the facts rather than on the principle. So for, for the reasons I've just identified, the simple fact of deciding to take advice cannot indicate that you know you have a worthwhile claim. And I'll come back to this. But of course, 
if you get run over on a pedestrian crossing, and this is a, an example that the majority gave, um, you're going to believe you've got a good claim. You might not know the word negligence. You might not understand the law of tort. Um, and even if your headaches start 10 days later, you might believe to yourself, I've got a worthwhile claim, even if causation hasn't been established. But that's a million miles from a situation in which you take advice, the advice is negative, it cannot follow from the fact of taking advice, necessarily. And sometimes it will. It will indicate a state of mind. I've been run over. I've gone to see X solicitors. That indicates I think I have a worthwhile claim. Why would I spend money on solicitors if I don't think I've got a worthwhile claim? Nobody does that. But that's not this case. And then finally, as to submitting a claim to the proposed defendant, I mean, part of the problem is that the, their lordships didn't explain what precisely was meant by a claim. I accept, in some circumstances, submitting a claim will constitute evidence of a belief that you have a worthwhile claim. But it will not always or necessarily do so. Parties, through their solicitors, often write to other parties or their solicitors asserting in confident terms that they have a claim hoping to get something out of it when in fact they believe the claim to be speculative or weak I don't remember seeing a letter from a solicitor saying please hand us some money we know that this is a bit of a trial and that the law is terribly unclear or against us, but we're going to ask you anyway. They just say, well, this is our case. It cannot follow from that, that the client must have imputed to him some constructive belief that he has a worthwhile claim. The mere fact that a solicitor has written on his behalf saying, here's an argument, please pay up. It cannot follow from that, necessarily, that the claimant believes he has a worthwhile claim. It may often be an indicator, but it can't necessarily be so. I mean, in policy terms, you might wonder whether you should have any further extension. Um, I mean, if, you, if you're alive to the issue, um, uh, you may or may not think it's such a marvellous claim, but I don't know whether you should be given any more time. Well, I mean, l l let us say... Um, ten days before the end of a six-year limitation period, um, your solicitor rings you up and says, you've got um, a million pounds that you've paid out here. I've just thought of an argument that you might want to claim it back. I don't, I don't think there's much in it, and it's certainly not the prevailing state of the law. Um, and you then say, well, okay, let me ring up the expert. And the council says, no, I think that's a, sorry, that's a bit rude to solicitors. You ring up the expert solicitor and you, ring, and you instruct QC. And, and they both say, no, that's a, I see the argument, but you know, I can see Article 11 might bite. But the, but the Article 12 um, justification for the, the season tickets bound to win. What's the policy justification for making you issue the writ just so that you can protect your claim? And I see that. At the same time, ignore for a moment the EU law aspects and so on. Yes. Conventional, um, ordinary common law claim, say, for mistake. Um, uh, if you get. To mistake the, of fact or mistake of law? Mistake of fact. Okay. Uh, if you get to the point uh, <coughs> within the six years, where you've identified the potential claim. Uh, you may not think it ultimately worth pursuing, but you know about it. Well, um, but what does it mean to know about the... I mean, 
if you know, for example, that you worked, I mean, I know this is not exactly the same, but you, you, you know you worked in a nuclear facility for the Ministry of Defence 20 years ago, and you know that you and all your co-workers have started getting cancer of some description or another, um, and you believe that the Ministry of Defence is responsible, I can see in those circumstances the policy of not letting time run indefinitely. But, but the current situation is very, very far away from that. And, and um, in, in the opening sentence, I think of paragraph 210 of the majority judgment. Lord Reed and Lord Hodge say correctly that everything depends on the circumstances of the case. You can't have a one-size-fits-all approach to what is the recognition of a worthwhile claim. Some, sometimes, when you're run over on a pedestrian crossing, you know the essential facts that are going to found your claim. Um, you might get a bit further away from that where... You, you might not, actually. Well, if, uh, pedestrian crossing. Um, let's take it away from a pedestrian crossing. No, I'm only using the example given quite, by the majority. But you, you're involved in... You're run over uh, by a car. Um, you, you know where you were, you know you got hit, you even know how far you got injured, you know which car did it to you. Um, but you're not clear whether um, it's going to be accepted that the driver was negligent or whether really you shouldn't have darted into the road when you did or whatever. Well, you know about the existence of the claim. Well, if you know that you darted into the road and it was the middle of the night and there were no street lights and you were wearing black, <laughs> you can confuse, you can produce all sorts of facts. You but can. You, you, you can have a situation where you know about the potential for a claim. You're not sure whether it's going to succeed or not. But, 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 okay, well, but in, in that context, I can see there might be, it's very fact specific. But we are in a situation not where the judge has found Jaztel was unsure whether it had a claim. I mean, he didn't have he didn't have to investigate this. He only had to investigate the question: what was their predominant belief? And their predominant belief was. The tax was due. Uh, Linklaters had identified a range of possible arguments with a range of possible applications, n n none of them indicating that they had a strong claim or one that was likely to succeed. On the balance, they thought it wouldn't succeed. The tax was due. How can they be said at that stage to know that they have a worthwhile claim? And it's all very odd, as you say, or, or imply, uh, because uh, when you're dealing with a mistake of law, or a mistake of law of this kind, where you're not simply ignorant, um, uh, what you are discovering um, is not the final answer. You don't get the final answer until some future state. Uh, and yet, plainly, it's implicit in the Supreme Court that you can discover enough before you get to the final state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, there are, there are, there's a range. I mean, you could have a High Court judgment in your favour. But the revenue is seeking permission to appeal. I mean, until until 2020 FII, you could wait. Uh, I think you, uh, under current circumstances, it would be much harder, much harder to say, well, I've got a, I've got a high court judgment in my favour, but I know that there's a chance the revenue will review the revenue. You've got permission to appeal. And it might go the other way. I mean, that's a very different case from this case. Yeah. Um, I mean, in 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 2000, for example. Uh, um, just to take one payment, Grundig hadn't been decided. Um, uh, well, perhaps that's not the right question. Um, we hadn't, there hadn't been a reference um, by anybody to the Court of Justice on the compatibility of the SDRT regime. The, the first time that happened was when the special commissioners referred the matter to the Court of Justice on the 19th of December, 2007. Now, it would have taken some time for that reference to percolate <coughs> out to the legal community, and that might be something that, in due course, might have to be investigated. But it wasn't common knowledge, and, and nothing in the judge's findings suggests it was common knowledge. And the revenue, I mean, Milena Friend below said to the judge, well, um, the revenue's pushback in March of 2000, which is, no, that's perfectly lawful. It's the, it's the season ticket argument. Uh, um, was it precisely the justification that Linklater said they, they, they would advance and that caused difficulties. But um, 
the mere fact that you know among a whole host of there was references to treaty freedoms on freedom of goods. Uh, um, I'm not quite sure how. Maybe that was a, maybe that was a typo. I don't know. Uh, um, it, 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 it is odd though. Um, leave aside uh, um, claims for mistake and fraud and whatever. Um, somebody does something to me which is undoubtedly a legal wrong and causes me loss. Do you know it on this hypothesis? I know everything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I may be in doubt as to whether it's good in law, but I think it's a pretty good claim in law. But I also know that my opponent has much deeper pockets than I have uh, and is going to fight really fiercely. Um, and by the time I get to the end of it, uh, they may be insolvent. Um, and so I think, well, I'm not going to pursue a claim. Six years pass, six years and a day later, the defendant wins the lottery and has lots of money. Well, that doesn't allow me to bring a claim. Um, in, in many list limitation circumstances, the fact that you might be going to face fierce opposition, the fact that you might be worn down, the fact that the defendant might not be good for the money is irrelevant. No, but, but, but Mr. Justice Marcus Smith didn't find. Jazz tells predominant state of mind was that this payment was unlawful as a matter of EU law. But nonetheless, they held off in bringing their claim, their worthwhile claim, because it was going to cost them too much and or the, the money wasn't quite big enough to make, the, to make it worth the candle. His finding of fact, from which there, and, I, and I, this is not the first time I'm going to say it, but I, so I apologize in advance, from which there is no challenge, is that their state of mind at all material times until the publication of the Advocate General's opinion in March 2000 tax was lawfully due. And how, I ask rhetorically, does that sit with thinking they had a worthwhile claim? How could they have brought a claim saying a, money, a mistake of law has been made when they thought a mistake of law hadn't been made? But does that not mean that FII and the Supreme Court is irrelevant? No. Because um, uh, they are ex hypothesis dealing, dealing with a situation where there has been a mistake. So why are they... Um, because you've got to believe in your mistake. You, it doesn't have the, 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 the big distinction, the big new ground broken by FII 2020, is that you don't have to know definitively. You, whereas under DMG, you could sit on your heels and wait until the Court of Justice had decided the point authoritatively in your favour. You can't do that anymore. Time begins to run from the point where you believe you've got a worthwhile claim. But unless the Supreme Court was wasting its time, it must be possible for you to have made a mistake of law and yet lose because Section 32 applies. It, it must be possible to have the state of mind such that you are making a mistake and at the same time uh, have discovered enough to be shut out. Yes, because, for example, you could have a situation in which, I just contemplated, um, uh, you pay over the money to the revenue commissioner um, when you think it's... I'm not even sure how it would work. I'll, I'll, can I think about yes. this question overnight? I mean, this sort of goes back to Lord Brown and DMG, I think. He thinks they run together. But the Supreme Court obviously doesn't think they run together. Well, that's what I mean. It, it, it's, it's paragraph 180 of the, of the majority judgment where they say, once you've discovered the mistake, you can't think you've got a, you, you, you're, you're making a mistake. Anymore. But that's the point my Lord is putting to me. I, I will think about that. But, there, but, but, but that, I, I would respectfully not agree with my Lord saying that they're wasting their time, because there could be a situation in which you believe that um, the money is... You there could be a passage of time. I mean, th there are two things, I suppose. One is, it may be that you have the belief that you could reasonably have discovered something different. That would be one situation. Yes. The other is that even though... Uh, uh, you, you had the belief and couldn't have discovered at first things change over time, such that time starts running. But I'm not sure that's the tenor of the Supreme Court. 
But but just to test it, if if on day one I um, have a big bill to pay to on SDRP, and I think to myself, I don't, I really want to find ways of avoiding having to pay this. I want to pay more tax than I need to. I'll go and um, seek advice from the, all the magic circle firms, and they all come back and say. Um, well, we could think of a range of arguments, but to be honest, Mr. X, none of them is going to work. We, uh, you know, one day they might, when the, if, if the law evolves dramatically from where it is now, but at the moment they don't. Um, years later, it turns out that they were all wrong, and that what they said would never come to pass did come to pass. X hypothesized, because the law has a declaratory effect, in Luxembourg and they say prospective only and that handful of cases where they do. You have ex hypothesized made a mistake. But how can it be that by taking advice from five magic circle firms, all of whom say yes. same in least chance, you've discovered your mistake? Mm. But is that going to require us to delve into what the content of the advice was? You say de minimis. Well, or is that irrelevant as a matter of principle? Well, um, on a subjective limb, the judge has found that they believe the money was due, and there's no challenge to that. It's true that the end of the link latest advice basically said, look, here's, here's a scenario where um, you could have a very strong argument. But we're not in that scenario. And the further away you move from that scenario, the greater the difficulty. And here, are, and Melena Friend didn't show you the document, the terminological agreement. There's a passage in the middle of the well, can, we, can we look at it just to answer my lord's question? I don't, I don't want to take you out of No, term. no, I, I'm, I'm anxious to assist my lord with the question. Um, it's tab 28 in the unagreed bundle. to start with the covering email. Which tells the reader, Pedro at Jaztel, that they're liable to pay. And that's just a preliminary point. The, 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 the meat of it is in the memorandum at page 162 to 164, which sets out various categories of share transactions, the first of which is the one that we were concerned with at that stage, namely the issue of new shares, where again it was said that payment was due by the 7th of January. Um, then under the four subparagraphs, as you are aware, the liabilities to SDRT and stamp duty arise because JazzPay is a UK incorporated company and wouldn't arise if it was incorporated in a different company. That may appear illogical and unfair, but it's unfortunately the state of UK legislation. For completeness, we thought that we should mention, so this is not Jastel picking, I believe I've got a good claim here. Please can you, Linklaters, advise me? This is, this is Linklaters raising it. For completeness, however, we thought we should mention that it appears to us that there may be grounds for questioning the validity of some or all of these charges on the basis of EU law. We summarise the grounds for the possible invalidity of these charges below. And then they talk about the practical matters and the, the factors that the Supreme Court has said are not relevant. You accept they have said that, do you? I, 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 well, um, <laughs> they're a bit, I'm, I'm, I'm not, no disrespect, but they're, it's a little unclear. I mean, paragraph uh, 255, can I show you 255 to answer yes. my Lord's question? I'm sorry to draw to that. Um, tab eight. I think it's two five five. Sorry, page. Yes, it's page four oh six of the bundle. Is 
it, it, again, it's not an entirely. Is that the, the second volume? It, this is the second. Yes, I'm sorry, I've put more mine into one, but yes, it's the second. Volume. First hand of the second. Yeah, page four o four o six of the okay. volume one four five five of the weekly law report. Second line, the answer to the question arising under 32.1 doesn't depend upon the characteristics of a particular claimant, whether, for example, it was inclined to await further developments to allow other taxpayers to make the running. So if, you're, if you've got a, um, on the Facebook what they're saying is, if you've got a £1,000 claim and you know that somebody else is making the running because they've got a million pound claim, you can't sit on your heels and do nothing about it. That, that's why I said what I said to my... Whether, whether, whether the court, Supreme Court's going further and excluding all factors from the worthwhile um, <coughs> consideration. So ju just relating this back to the memorandum, there Linklater's say, as a practical matter, having regard to the sums involved, you're, you're not suggesting that the fact that it was 700,000 rather than a larger... It makes it not a worthwhile account. I mean, it's a, uh, th that is the practical reality, but I can't submit that's what the Supreme Court uh, And length and complexity of potential litigation. I can't, I mean, I, I don't profess any, I'm sorry to sound enthusiasm for this test, but there's a limit to how far I can push my argument. I hope I'm being realistic. Yes. Uh, I, I understand the point you're making, Mr. Kaczynski. What, what, speaking for myself, what I do find a little curious is those passages where the Supreme Court refer to the business well, and, and having a, a certain amount and certain number of staff and certain level of resources. Well, well the, the average chippy, I suspect, is not going to have the access to link places. I, I don't mean any disrespect. Well, then, no, that, that's why I said before there are, I'm, there are, there are different passages in the, in the judgment pointing. Uh, we, yes. If you're talking about what a what a well resourced corporation, multi you know, multinational corporation can do, uh, my my lord has the point. So it is a bit difficult to reconcile those two. Um, so it might be that if I was acting for the chippy, I would be making a different submission to my lord, Lord Justice New. But I am jazz tail. I understand. Yeah. Uh, um, but then over the page. Um, we've seen this all before, um, in the first non-indented passage, they're talking about a context that did not arise. This is an, this is a, an IPO, not a share-for-share share exchange in another member state. Yeah. And then, I don't think my friend took me to the next bit. While the grounds of questioning the validity of the 1.5% charges remain on the issue and transfer of shares into a clearance service, I think he certainly took us to that sentence. Yes, it's the next bit underneath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They become less clear-cut as one moves away from the scenario of a UK incorporated company acquiring a company incorporated in another member state, which is not our case. Mm -hmm. The difficulties in attempting to question the validity of the charge include, one, the uncertainty of whether Euroclear should be considered to be an EU clearance service, since it ostensibly operated from Belgium, or a clearance service operated by a non-EU incorporated company of Morgan Guarantee Trust Company in New York, and if so, whether the latter interpretation would undermine arguments about the invalidity of the charge based on EU law. I don't think in the end the government ran that one, but you know, this is all predictive. And, and, and just trying to understand the significance of these different points. Does a... We know that we've got the ADR clearance system. Yes. Bit, and I think point B goes to the ADR element. Uh, yes, but point A goes to everything. And it, uh, that was what I was going to ask. Does it go to everything or merely some element? Of no, I think it goes to everything. Yep. B, whether the validity of the charge relating to the issue of ADRs, American depository receipts, by a non-EU resident entity, i.e. Morgan Guarantee, would be questioned under EU law. C, whether even if an argument about the invalidity of the charge arising on the issue of the shares could be sustained, the provisions of Article 12, which permit the levying of the transfer, levying a tax on the transfer, would prevent any successful attack on the charge relating to the transfer by existing shareholders. And indeed, in the end, 
as my lords will recall, the government ran the season ticket argument because they said that in substance, the 1.5% on the issue was in lieu of the, the hypothetical three transfers that would later take place once it had left the UK and entered into the EU clearance system. Yeah. And then they say this is all going to be strenuously resisted by... Um, uh, just before you go there, D, is that an ADR point again? No, that, that's a, that, that goes back to categories C and D on the previous page. Ah, yes, yes, I see. So that's not relevant for our purposes. Well, no. Not so, it's not relevant for the IPA. Yeah. Then they gave them options. Um, pay the charge, pay the charge, lodge a protective claim. And we'll see what the judge says about that. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm slightly jumping ahead of myself because I wanted yes. to go through the passages of the judge. But... but um, I think I was trying to answer my Lord, Lord Justice Singh's yes. question. Do we have to go into the, yes. the, the advice? And I was showing you what the <coughs> advice was. Yes. Uh, um, did it say anywhere, we think you've probably got a good claim, but it's only for 600 quid, or I'm being slightly facetious, it's only for 2,000 pounds, and it's going to take years of expensive litigation with no certainty of the outcome. So it's up to you whether <coughs> you pursue it. They, they weren't saying that at all. We've seen what findings of fact the judge made about this, that it was tentative, marginal, um, qualified, not robust, and although it injected some marginal doubt into Jasdor's state of mind, its predominant view at all times, despite this advice, was it didn't have a, it didn't have a claim. And I've said before, I find it, what I find is irrelevant. It is very difficult, in my respectful submission, to see how you can square that with a belief, a belief in the truth of your assertion. You've got, that's what you've got to have. Supreme Court tells us you have to believe you have a worthwhile claim. And the judge says they, they believe the tax was due. How can you believe you have a worthwhile claim that the tax is not due and simultaneously believe that the tax... If you make a claim to the revenue, yes. saying we're paying this, but you've got to pay it back, isn't that effectively asserting, I believe in the truth of no. the claim that you owe it to me? No. No. That's why I made my point before about the submission of a claim. If you issue a writ or claim form, signed by a statement of truth that says, I believe in the facts stated here to be true, uh, um, uh, you absolutely do, you must have that belief, otherwise you can't properly you say You don't have to say anything about whether you believe the statement of law to be true. Well, if the, if the, if the claim in restitution is based only on a mistake of law, I would query whether it would be appropriate for somebody to sign a statement of truth saying, because there's only one formulation in CPR Part 22, and it's, I believe, the facts stated in the statement of claim of truth. Um, yes, that's uh, fact, not law, isn't it? It, it is, but uh, I think the policy behind CPR Part 22 would be um, undermined if somebody could say, well, I believe facts A, B, and C to be true. I, I know in my mind that that doesn't mean I've got a good claim in law, but I'm, I'm asserting, for example, I believe that I'm entitled to the relief, or I believe I'm entitled to damages. I mean, you must believe that to be true. People all the time include arguments about law in their pleadings, which they think <laughs> might be right or might not be right, or indeed mm. they think aren't right. Well, maybe I need to move away from Part 22, but I'm going to answer my Lord's yeah. question. Yeah. But how, can, you, can you write a letter to the revenue saying, um, we, you know, can link later? doing the best for their clients, say, we think this is all probably unlawful, so please hand us the money back. Simultaneously with their client actually believing that the money is due, of course that can happen. I mean, otherwise, uh, in, you know, a solicitor has a duty to its client to do the best it can for its client. If the solicitor thinks, all I need to do to get my client a million pounds or 1.8 million pounds is to write a letter, they're not going to write the letter saying, well, we think there might be an argument here. We're not really sure. Um, you might want to think about giving us some money or not. But that, that, no solicitor, that would be a, probably a breach of duty to their client. You don't, your, your, your duty to the, to, to, to the, is not to the other side to lay bare all the weaknesses of your case. Put it differently. Mm -hmm. 
I can't see that there would have been anything improper about Jastel issuing court proceedings. They would have said, we, we, we made this uh, payment, uh, the money was not in fact due because the law is not as the revenue has stated it. Um, can we have the money back, please? Well, whether, my Lord, I, I, I'm not sure I assent to that proposition, but whether you are right or not, the question still asked by the Supreme Court is, do you believe in the essential facts in a fact case, or the essential elements your claim based on mistake of law. Do you have a belief in this? If you, if you believe that the money is lawfully due, primary legislation, it's not optional, somebody said, well, you might have an EU law claim, but we don't think it'll succeed. Can you really believe in the truth of your assertion that you have a worthwhile claim? And we would submit the answer is no. Even if... Even if um, Linkwood said, so we might as well try and get it back. It's not going to, we don't have to issue a claim, we're not at cost risk. It's a, it's a two page letter citing some materials, and we, you may get some money back. I must say, I'm not very happy at the suggestion that one should put a letter of that type into a different category from the issue of a writ. I mean, here you have a solicitor engaging in a formal demand sent to a government department saying in terms that we believe the laws of such and such, and these are our arguments, we think they're good. I mean, I, I'm not at all, as I say, I'm just, I jib at the thought that that should be treated differently for limitation purposes. I mean, it's not quite an estoppel, but it's, it's a sort of quasi, I mean, that sort of area on, you really can't be heard at one and the same time to say you don't believe you have a valid claim, and here you are writing to the revenue asserting it as a valid claim and asking for the money back money which is prima facie due under the unambiguous wording of a domestic statute. But my Lord, Lord Justice knew he said to me a moment ago that it would be nothing improper <laughs> about issuing a claim form when you're really un unclear about what the position is. Well, so why is it improper to do something short of a claim? It's not, it's not improper, to... but it's perfectly consistent with okay. your actually having the belief yeah. that you do have a claim. But mm. my, my Lord, I, I would accept that in certain... That, that's why I said that in certain circumstances I accept that a letter of claim, a submission of a letter of claim, is evidence of what your belief is. But in this case, we have a finding of fact, unchallenged by the, finding of fact by the judge, unchallenged by the revenue, that they believe they didn't have a claim. They believe that the money was due. I mean, it, it, it would have been open if, if, if they had wanted to. For the revenue, I'm not saying they'd have succeeded. They, they, they could have mounted an Edwards and Bairstow challenge in this court. They could have said, on the evidence before the judge, including, I mean, below, there's a sense of deja vu in this case, because below, Mr. Baldry did strenuously argue that the Linklater's letter and the January letter meant that there had been no mistake of law. That's his, that was his pleaded case, that was his case in his mm. skeleton, that was his case in his oral submission. And that was the case which was rejected. And they could, as I say, have said, well, that's an Edwards and Bairstow mistake, uh, error of law. The, the only reasonable reading of the Linklater's letter and the uh, um, Linklater's advice was that there was no mistake, which is what his case was. And, and of course, uh, here in reality, that, I, mean, I see there was no oral evidence on this at all. It was just no, yes, because no, nobody wrote documents. anything. No. Uh, we, we, th there was this proper CPR compliant disclosure. Everything was disclosed. Everything was put into a mm. file. There was a what amounted to a narrative account given by Mr. Garcia. Uh, it, there was a sensible agreement, if I may say so, between myself and Mr. Baldry. But there was no point in him cross-examining Mr. Garcia, who could have said, "Well, that, the documents say what they say." Yes. And so I said, "Well, you don't. Have, you, you can challenge our case by reference to the documents without putting the points mechanically, mechanistically, to Mr. Garcia." And that's what happened. Yes. Mm. When they could have, my friend could have said, "Well, Edwards and Bairstow, no live evidence." We're going to mount a, a challenge to the findings of fact, and you can look at the documents for themselves. I mean, they're not doing that. I really keep on banging that drum. They're not doing that. Uh, uh, but, but, but they can't then ask you to come to other inferences of fact about the state of Jastel's mind that are inconsistent with the judge's findings that they don't challenge. Yeah. Well, that's why the focus this morning was very much on the second limb rather than the subject of knowledge. Well, I entirely understand why the focus is. Yes. But in that case, 
there is no evidence there's no evidence of what anybody other than one partner and a couple of associates at Lignators are saying to Jazz Tell. There's no evidence of. I mean, well, there's the fact that the letter was sent. I mean, that, you can't get away from that. But the fact that the letter was sent cannot mean that the objective limb was satisfied if the subjective limb was not satisfied. Well, that's what I'm not quite sure about. <laughs> well, can I just, I mean, I, I, if I can tease that out. Mm. I mean, the, the, the letter, if anything, can only go to what Jazz Tell's state of mind was. Either it provides evidence that Jazz Tell had discovered that it had a claim, and I say it didn't because you see the judge's findings of fact. It can't be evidence of what could, could with reasonable diligence have been discovered, because for that you need, as the Supreme Court said thrice over in its judgment, you need um, evidence about um, the evolving state of the law. Um, well, I, mean, I wonder if you're overstating that. Mm. They say, you know, often you're going to need yes. that. But if you have evidence specific to this particular payer, yes, I don't know why you do need that. Well, because if the evidence specific to that particular, because the, the test is no lower on the objective standard than on the subjective standard. The test is, do you... Or could you, with reasonable diligence, have discovered that you had a worthwhile claim? If, notwithstanding the letter, your subjective state of mind is that you do not have a worthwhile claim, how can that self-same letter be evidence of what you could, with reasonable diligence, have I, mean, I see how you put it in this particular mm -hmm. case. But the generality, um, uh, suppose somebody went to a lawyer. The lawyer said, you've got a marvelous case. Yes. Um, but they subjectively didn't believe it. Oh, I, in, um, in, in that hypothesis, I would, I, I would accept that there is a distinction to be made. But we're not in that case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a, 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 and, and there's no evidence of... You know, it, it's true that at the end of the letter, Linklater said, if you want to pursue this further, we can go away and really have a much more... I'm, I'm using my own language, deep dive into all of this. Uh, and they were clearly in, not instructed to do that. On the contrary, as we see from the later letters, they were instructed to drop the point. Uh, uh, um, uh, there's no evidence that Linklater's original advice that said it's all a bit weak is negligent. And there's no evidence about what would have happened at that time, years before HSBC <coughs> was referred, st still more years before there was an AGO, still more years before there was a final decision. But, None of the High Court claims in our globe, for example, were issued until after the AGO's decision. So it's not as if there was a, there's anything that Malone Friends can point to, a welter of a generally accepted opinion that SDRT was contrary to EU law. Yeah, that may be right. But, but uh, in the Unagreed Bundle, Volume 1, tab 33, yes. we have the letter that Linklater sent to... The revenue on the 11th of January. Yes. 2000. And they said, we consider that there are very good grounds. But, but the judge found an unchallenged findings of fact, despite that, that Jazdell's state of mind was. The no, 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 that's the subjective limb. On, right. the, ob on the objective limb, but why this isn't this enough to, mm. to put a, a reasonable person on notice? Why doesn't this amount, in effect, to saying that, 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 that uh, a person could? with reasonable diligence, have discovered that they did have very good grounds for the view that the provisions of the domestic legislation are unlawful under EU law, in particular under Article 11 of the Directive. Because this is an assertion. If this was advice to somebody, if this was the, the, if this was the advice that was being given to Jazdell, but Jazdell nonetheless said, I don't believe your advice, would be in my Lord, Lord Justice... I'm you sorry, Mr. Grzynski, you keep coming back to Jazdell's I don't, frankly, for the purpose of this argument, care about anyone's state of mind. I'm posing an objective question, right. which is, given that Linklater's said, we consider that there are very good grounds, why wouldn't that mean that a reasonable person could, with reasonable diligence, have discovered? Have discovered? Because um, the Linklater's letter was an assertion. It did not represent what anybody's... It says, we consider mm -hmm. that there are. But, my lord... Sorry, to, solicitors doing their duty to their clients all the time 
whether it's in settlement negotiations, pre-action correspondence, will say, we think our client's got a very strong case. It can't automatically follow that somebody, that, that, that the objective standard is met by that evidence. Well, I understand the submission. I, I understand my lord is not enthusiastic about the submission. <laughs> well, I, I, like my lord, I'm not happy about a responsible firm of solicitors writing to a state agency charged with administering the law asserting that something is owed and then it said that, oh well that doesn't really amount to anything more than we're just doing our best to help our clients out the, the, the question is what could a um, claimant with reasonable diligence have discovered yes. whether my lord is happy or unhappy with this letter it, it does not follow even if my lord is unhappy that this letter is evidence of what a, of what a claimant could have discovered. No, what, obviously, what, well, we'll have to consider that submission. I do understand the submission. I mean, what if, just, just to follow it through, what if this letter having been written and the revenue having replied as they did um, in the letter at tab 40? Um, this is all lawful, particularly paragraph... Two. Yeah, that's interesting. They don't run the uh, Euroclear point or whatever. They uh, they run the Article they, Twelve point. They run the Article Twelve point. Mm -hmm. So let's hypothesise that that um, the reader, uh, um, both Mr. Pevsner at Linklaters and the client, see the revenue saying this is all saved by Article Twelve. Um, uh, clearly, the, the revenue, being a responsible public authority, was writing what. It, Nonetheless, hypothesize then that uh, the client says, well, I see what you, you, you've said to us, Linklaters, that um, there's a possible claim. We've, we've, we've written to the revenue. The revenue have come back and identified one of the points that you said was a difficulty. Let's hypothesize that at that stage, a reasonably diligent claimant in the position of Jowstown or any of the GLO claimants said, well, we're going to go five top city firms and work out what the answer is. If, we don't know what the answer would have been at that stage, we haven't got the evidence, but if the answer would have been, well, uh, we actually agree with the revenues season ticket argument, which incidentally was an argument that was supported in the Court of Justice, not just by the United Kingdom, but by the Commission as well. So this is not, this is not some um, thin argument in defence. Uh, so, uh, Maybe they'd have called the commission. The commission said, no, we think the season ticket works. And all the law firms say no, that this isn't a good argument. How, how can it be reasonably said that, that the fact that Linklaters wrote the letter indicates that a reasonably diligent person in the position of Jazz would have discovered the mistake of law? It wouldn't have discovered the mistake of law. It this really comes wrong. back to your fundamental point that when it comes to the objective limb of the Supreme Court's test, yes. That is a factual exercise on which the trial judge never embarked yes. because he didn't have to. Yes. And uh, either it follows that we should not give permission to the uh, revenue to amend its grounds to include this ground, or it would have to be remitted. M my Lord is exactly encapsulated up. Because otherwise, the, the use of, I don't, I'm not saying I agree with it, no, no, you, you, but you submit that otherwise there's a real danger here that we're going to decide on the objective limb, but on the basis of only partial evidence. Indeed so. Mm. One very small part of the evidence. And that's probably a convenient moment. Uh, we, I particularly probably, uh, have taking you a long way outside your course. No, and in fact, the um, council always says this, but it's been very <laughs> <laughs> it, it has been very valuable, and I suspect I, as a result, will be capable of being shorter than I would otherwise have been, particularly at the tail end of my submissions, and I was going to go through the documents and make some submissions on it. I still need to show you the relevant passages mm. of the judgment on which I particularly focus. Yeah. Um, I'm sure I should be done by lunchtime. Uh, in which case, 10.30 uh, in the morning.